Hello, I'm Angela Diffley. Welcome to Inside the Americas. Today, we take a look at the US Supreme Court's end-of-year rulings and the controversy they've triggered. Fresh water supplies in danger in Uruguay as a vital dam touches a historic low. And don't breathe, just keep eating. Face first, hands free, as many pies as you can eat, the American way. All that coming up in today's program. Good to have you with us. So first to the US and what was for some a grim ending to a year in the Supreme Court. For others, good news. Last week, the top judges in the United States issued a series of controversial rulings changing years of legal precedent. Most of this group of justices were nominated by Republican presidents. They chose to end student debt relief, end affirmative action for universities and cut back LGBTQ rights. And here to discuss the impact of it all is France 24 journalist Peter O'Brien. Hi, Peter. Angela. So, first of all, take us uh, through what happened, th those rulings last week. Well, we've really seen the cementing of the Supreme Court's more Trumpist direction, if I can put it that way. Um, the first decision on a case involving a graphic designer who didn't want to uh, serve a uh, website for a gay wedding effectively gives businesses the right to refuse LGBTQ uh, customers and opens the way for more rulings to enshrine uh, LGBTQ rights to be upended. The second big decision, universities in the US can no longer make admissions decisions based on race. This was called affirmative action and that's essentially the idea of giving minority Minorities a step up uh, when they when it's harder for them to usually be admitted to university. Um, this has ended decades of legal precedents uh, scrapping this rule. And finally, there's the big middle finger to Joe Biden. That's really the decision to scrap his $430 billion worth of student debt relief. It was a key campaign pledge of his, and it was about to wipe 20, up to $20,000 dollars of debt uh, for millions of Amer Americans. Instead, uh, repayments that had been paused will have to be remade again from October. And we can listen to the president's reaction to that one. 16 million people had already been approved. The money was literally about to go out the door. And then Republican elected officials and special interests stepped in. They said, no, no. Literally snatching from the hands of millions of Americans thousands of dollars in student debt relief that was about to change their lives. You know, these Republican officials just couldn't bear the thought of providing relief for working class, middle class Americans. So there's been lots of reaction to this, but it's not the first time there's been controversy at the uh, end of year of the Supreme Court. We had that big landmark decision last year on Roe versus Wade. Yeah, overturning Roe versus Wade this time last year was clearly had clearly had the biggest shockwaves of any of these decisions so far. But remember that last year the the court also expanded gun rights for the first time, making it a constitutional right to ha carry a handgun in public. And there was the decision that curbs the authority of the Environmental Protection Agency to reduce emissions coming from power plants, ruling that it can't put state-level caps on carbon emissions. And although there have been some surprise decisions along the way between these big end-of-year rulings, um, really politically charged rulings like the, the, these big ones that I mentioned and the, the expenses scandal that hit the uh, courts, uh, two of the courts judges last autumn mean that public trust in the Supreme Court has hit all time lows. And these Supreme Court justices, of course, they're, they're nominated, so they're appointed for life. So this isn't the last controversy we'll have. What other sort of uh, areas might be targeted, do you think, in the future? We know already what they've got their eye on for the ne their next term. It gets a bit technical, but they are essentially going to be targeting US federal agencies. So they've already agreed to hear cases challenging the constitutionality of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's funding and how enforcement works at the Securities and Exchange Commission. This could overturn also a decades-long precedent in helping federal agencies defend their actions in court. It's hard not to see these moves as part of a tradition of conservative attacks on uh, US government agencies claiming the White House has too much of a say over them. And as a word of warning, judging executive branch decisions to be unconstitutional could have major ramifications. I mean, these decisions could shake up the entire way that the US is governed. 
Just very quickly, Peter, do you think that any backlash to this among some voters could benefit, for example, the Democrats? Well, we did see with Roe versus Wade polling benefits for pro-abortion candidates, Democratic candidates, and, of course, Joe Biden and Democrats will be looking for ways to push back on these decisions. But if you look at the other decisions we've had last week, public opinion is more split on things like allowing businesses to deny services to gay people on Biden's low loan plan. It's not as clear-cut as with Ro Roe versus Wade. So many Republicans are still basking in their good, good fortune that uh, Trump was able to appoint three judges. OK, well, we'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Uh, Peter O'Brien there. To Mexico now, which has seen record-breaking temperatures in recent days, with some locations seeing monthly or even all-time records. At least 112 people have died as a result of natural extreme temperatures since March. That's according to the country's authorities, giving us our rather bleak number of the week for this week. And moving on to the impact of climate change in Uruguay, where years of drought is causing crisis. The reservoir behind the Paso Severino Dam, which normally serves 60% of the country's population with fresh water, has touched a historic low. That's due to an unprecedented three-year drought. As of the 28th of June, only 2.4% of its total water capacity remained. Nicholas Rushworth tells us more. There is grass growing where there used to be water. Large parts of the bed of the reservoir at the Paso Severino Dam in Uruguay are dry. One local retired farmer is shocked at seeing the water level so low. I've been here several times. I've seen the water level gradually going down to the point where it's completely empty now. There's practically no water left. We thought we'd never reach this point. Low rainfall has meant that the Paso Severino Reservoir, the country's largest, is now estimated to have less than 2 million cubic metres of water. It used to supply 67 million cubic metres. Drastic drops in fresh water supplies throughout Uruguay prompted the government in May to double the maximum allowable levels of chloride and sodium. We had to mix fresh water coming from the high basin with water with quite a lot of sodium and salinity coming from low basin areas. And this changed the conditions of the water supplied to the people. That has left tap water undrinkable for many people. The government has exempted taxes on bottled water in response, but the poorest members of society cannot always afford the increasing cost of the bottles. First it was COVID, and now it's water. You cannot buy bottled water here. Some people can buy it, and others can't. The government has declared a water emergency, saying supplies will not be cut off. We're going to help as much as we can so that people can have drinkable water. Almost a third of those affected today will receive it for free. Among the solutions proposed, more investment in reservoir construction, with the government saying the situation will get worse before it gets better. Well, now, one of the planes that was used on the so-called death flights during the military dictatorship in Argentina between 1976 and 1983 has been returned to the country, where it is to be displayed in a museum in memory of the so-called disappeared. The regime of the time threw thousands of people from these planes into the middle of the sea between Argentina and Uruguay. It's estimated that around 30,000 political opponents of the dictatorship of the time were killed. This from our team in Buenos Aires. It's on this landing strip in Buenos Aires airport that this Skyfan plane used to take off by night to operate the sinister death flights during the military dictatorship. The plane was then sold and lost. It's now back in Argentina. On that plane, our relatives spent their last moments before being thrown alive from it. That is why it needed to come back to Argentina, as a part of our history. From this plane, hundreds of political opponents were thrown into the Rio de la Plata.
The plane was found in Florida 10 years ago thanks to Giancarlo Serrano and Miriam Lewin's journalistic and photographic investigation. The flight plans of that time, found with the plane, were the ultimate proof used to condemn the pilots in 2017. As many repressors that fled from Argentina and were forced to come back to answer before the law, the plane comes back to answer before the memory. It is very strong, symbolically. For Miriam Lewin, a journalist and an ex-prisoner, survivor from the dictatorship, this quest was a personal one. I often wonder, without being able to answer, why did I survive? But I know what I survived for, to reveal the truth, to obtain justice, and to ensure that we never forget. When the plane was finally located, Mabel Cariaga picked up the battle. She knocked on all doors for the plane to be bought and brought back to Argentina. Her mother, Esther Cariaga, was one of those thrown alive from it in 1977. It was a moral obligation to have it back, towards history, towards my children, towards every young Argentinian. For her, my mother, especially for her, and for all of the others, every one of them. For its 30,000 disappeared people, Argentina keeps on a relentless work of memory, truth and justice. The return of that plane is another step in that direction. It will soon be on display as a refutable proof of the horror of those times. And finally, Americans celebrated Independence Day on the 4th of July, of course, this week. It's a fun day for everyone, but for some, it's a competitive business. Pictures here of America's champion pie eaters slugging it out in a hands-free contest, while those munching hot dogs vie for the coveted mustard belt. And the final hot dog winner ate 62 in 10 minutes only in the United States. That's it from me. Take care. Goodbye. Want to know? Find out here. With France 24, learn to tell what's true from what's fake on social networks. Identify the false rumors in European news stories. Get reliable information about migration. Truth or fake, every day we bring you information that is verified and put into context. France 24 is news you can rely on every day across all platforms.